Well, it's so good to see you. Um, you're here despite the fact that you knew that I was speaking today. <laughs> and you, you come, you know, we, we speak the truth. We speak sound doctrine. We don't try to uh, scratch your ears, that itch. We try to bring the truth. And so, thank you for coming today. I always uh, start this by telling you that 40% of adults, believers, unbelievers, believe that we are in the end times. I mean, now we see another war starting in Israel. Um, I can't tell you prophetically where this might fit in, but um, it's just another war. Wars and rumors of wars. And, you know, we pray for the peace of Israel. We need to pray for, for those that um, have lost so many, you know. Um, but I, I got to tell you, I'm even watching some secular uh, YouTube videos where there's this guy named Peter Zahan. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but he's a geopolitical analyst, and he looks at economics, demographics, global trade, and politics throughout the world. I mean, this guy is sharp. And he talks about how global trade is very fragile. So if one piece of the global trade starts to fall apart, it, it's like a domino effect. And so I don't think we've seen yet the full effect of what's happening with energy and food and all these different things with Ukraine and Russia. And now we see Israel under attack. Um, you know, we don't know. We don't know how this is all going to affect the globe. Um, and then there was this, there was this uh, physicist. His last name is Weinstein. It's, you take away the W, and it's Einstein. I mean, this guy, this guy is sharp. And he, what he is saying is if you... It, you the physicist, he's, he says, got us into this mess. And he's talking about nuclear. The physicist got us into this mess. We need to get us out. And so he starts talking about all these alien ships that, that we're seeing and how they're doing these maneuvers that are just so crazy. And he's a physicist. And he's saying that they're bending space-time, that they're doing things outside of Einstein's theory of relativity or whatever it is. And so he says, I want the government to give me a load of cash, uh, a bunch of physicists, and let us get to work. Because he's saying we can bend space-time and go somewhere else. I mean, this is how... This is, listen, I, this is not true. <laughs> there's no aliens, there's no alien ships, nothing like that. But it's just, everyone's looking at, at the globe and seeing the chaos that's going on. Uh, you know, we saw the, the emergency alert. Uh, it was funny because my son called me up and he, from school and he said, do you know about this emergency alert that's coming? I said, yes. He said, it's going to go off for a half hour. I said, no, son, I don't think it's going to go off for a half hour. He's, and then you hear a kid in the background saying, it says right here on Google, 29 plus 1. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen that way. But it was interesting to see the emergency alert here. The emergency alert was going on in Russia, same day. And they're doing nuclear drills is what, what they were saying on, on the news. I don't, you know, you don't know what to believe anymore. But so 
it's just we're living in some unprecedented times. We really are. So, as we go into this, we, we talk about the rapture of the church and the end times. And I've heard people say, our church is so rapture heavy. They're so end times heavy. You know, it's just too much. And I got to tell you something. Why do we talk about these things? This is why. And I'll, let's go there right now, actually. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And I, I just learned something this morning that is just pretty cool. If you remember the, the 6,000 year idea that Clarence Larkin had and, and today there, many people are talking about it where the 6,000 year from creation is going to begin the millennial reign, the 7,000th year of rest. And I just learned some stuff this morning that, and the guy that told it to me said he's got to verify it, but that the 6,000th year might be 2024. And I just thought, man, that, that is so cool. And it, it's, there's, a, there's a guy that does, he looked at uh, numerology in the Bible and the years of, you know, Adam's life and so on and so forth were actually in the Bible at one point and then in the 1800s they were taken out. And so, again, it hasn't been verified yet, but it's very interesting to see that these, these years added up to where the 6,000th year would, would be in 2024. I thought that was very cool. And looking at 2 Peter 3, we see that the Lord, in, in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but it's long-suffering for us, towards us. Uh, verse 8 also said that, don't forget that one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So go to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This is why we're so rapture heavy. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? How do you want to be found in the end? How are we supposed to be? How are we supposed to act? That's why we talk about these things. And we're going to learn a few key points here, I believe, that relate to Daniel and how we're supposed to act. So let's do, we're going to do a quick review, and then we're going to look at something that I, I totally passed over, and I can't believe I did it. When I went back and I looked, we're going to touch on something that happened with Josiah, and then, then we'll get in to Daniel and, and show you a few quick points. So if you remember last time we talked about the Lord using Nebuchadnezzar to send Nebuchadnezzar. And with that, we looked at the overall hierarchy of things. We saw that Satan is in charge of the world, right? But God, God is in control of it all. He is sovereign he allows Satan to do things. And so we remember that for some encouragement, we looked at Revelation 12, 7, 8. We saw uh, Michael and his angels fighting against 
Satan and his angels, and Satan was cast out of heaven. And God did not have to lift a finger. God is in control. Satan's a created being, and God created him. And then in Revelation 20.10, we saw Satan thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. So understanding that God is in control, we learned that, number one, sometimes the Lord uses evil to get his will done. So God used Nebuchadnezzar to punish Judah. And I pose the question to you, how long does America think we can get away with what we're doing? I don't think it's going to be much longer. We talked about the fearless leader of America. And I thought about it afterwards and I thought, you know what? He really is fearless. He doesn't fear God. In spite of his... Uh, proclamation that he's a Christian. I don't know if you knew that, but he says he's a Christian that is part of the Catholic religion. And he's fearless. He doesn't fear the Lord. Um, We started this country on Judeo-Christian values. And we looked at how there was a slow decay since the 60s. We watched that video. We, we saw all those graphs. When they took the Ten Commandments out of the school, the Bible, prayer, out of the school, we saw devastating statistics of teen pregnancy, STDs, divorce rates, single-parent families, unmarried couples living together, SAT scores plummeted, violent crimes, all seem to be affected by the removal of prayer and the Word. And we, know, we noted that We're going to start, number two, we're going to start losing our way the very second we take the word out of our lives. And then we saw a great reprieve with King Manasseh, uh, after King Manasseh, with great King Josiah. Josiah began repairing the temple. He began purging it of everything. Uh, all the idols. He began purging the land of all the things that his great-grandpa set up and that his grandpa and dad kept. And we talked about doing that in our own lives and how we could purge these things. We can, we can do away with iniquity. We can turn things around with God's help. Amen. And then I found what Josiah, what happened with Josiah. And we're going to turn to 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. And we're going to start in verse 8. Then... Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book, he tore his clothes. And I started to research what that meant. He tore his clothes. And on the screen, you'll see a QR code, and there's, one, there's a link in your uh, app. And this references the article that I, that I read about 
the tearing of clothes. And what the article did is went through the whole Bible looking for where it talks about tearing of clothes and the emotions behind it, the situations behind each one. And what you find out is that the clothes portray the status of a person. And the clothes uh, of a king have all the finest material and take all this time to be put together. And you even find in verse 14 of this chapter in 2 Kings, you find uh, that there's keepers of the clothes, security guards that make sure the clothes are safe. They're precious uh, to the owner. And when Josiah tore his clothes, he had all the emotions of all these different uh, times that, that people tore his, their clothes. And he expressed sorrow because of the unfaithfulness of his people, fear of God's punishment because of their sin, despair, anger, and finally, and I think most importantly, repentance. Josiah had never heard this word before. The only word from God that he would have heard is from Jeremiah and Zephaniah, who were prophets at that time. And I, I found it so interesting that Jeremiah is actually the son of Hilkiah, the priest who found that word who found the book of the law, who found the Bible in the temple and gave it and read it, uh, gave it to the scribe and read it to Josiah. And up to this point, Josiah began, when he was purging, it was only after prayer. And I had to wonder why did God or why did Josiah seek God in prayer because in this point up to this point he had never uh, the Bible doesn't show who the positive influences were in his life I tried to track down his mother's lineage and his father's lineage and that was to no avail and so the only thing that I could find is that Josiah began to seek the God of his father or ancestor, David. Now, here's, here's what I took out of this, is that only God can move the heart of man. Now, man makes the decision whether to follow or not. But we know, even from Romans 1, that God is evident to all. And God moves the heart of man. God moved the heart of Josiah. And this goes for us too. We can't earnestly seek God unless he moves our heart in that direction. I don't understand predestination. I'm not even going to go there. I'll leave that up to pastor someday if you want to preach on that one. Because I don't get it. But I do know that if, if God has moved us in that direction and we've accepted it, it's an absolute divine miracle that we are saved, that God would choose, especially someone like me, just a wreck. Why would he choose me to be saved? You know, of all people. So, the Holy Spirit said, don't squander this precious gift that he's given us. And he said, be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's Colossians 1.9. So, Matthew Poole's commentary says, while Josiah was yet young in the 16th year of his age, when he was entering into the age and state of temptations and useful lusts and had the administration of his kingdom wholly 
in his own hand and power and none to rebuke or restrain him. Yet even then he begins to be religious in, God, in good earnest. He had all the power and prestige. He could have done whatever he wanted. Everything was at the tip of his fingers. He could have done anything, yet he purposed it in his heart to follow after the God of his father David, just like Daniel purposed, purposed in his heart at a young age. And we're going to talk about that soon. Then when the word was read to Josiah, he tore his clothes. Now here's the application. Purpose the Bible in your life. Purpose the Bible in your life. By this I mean direct your mind towards the Word. Pay attention to the Word. Seek it deep into your heart. Or in Hebrew, into your labob. Everyone say labob. I'm not flexing my Hebrew here. I'm saying this because... Later on in page 10 of my notes, it's going to show up again. Okay? The heart is your inner man, your comprehending mind, your affections, and your will. That's where you want the Word of God to be. What is your reaction when you read the Word of God or hear the Word of God? Is there ever a time where you're reading it and you're like, oh, I got to do that. I'm failing in this area. Listen, if you're reading the Word of God and it, you haven't ever had that feeling, keep reading. Keep reading. Because it'll happen. And you're going to have to make some choices. You're going to have to set up some boundaries in your life when you read the Word. And these choices that you make are good because God is good and he wants what's best for us. Not our best life now, but he wants what's best for us. He's, he's trying to set up boundaries for us in the word. The word of God made Josiah tear his clothes and I'm saying that it'll tear our hearts when we read it and when we hear it. There's, uh, I'm going to try to use the pronouns they and them. So, no, so, <laughs> right. This is so that I don't, I, I don't want to point this person out, okay? So I don't even want to give their gender. But there's this pre precious person that's been coming here for a while. And when they came, uh, there was some confusion about the LGB stuff. And they had friends that were along these lines. And they even came with a shirt that, that said, uh, you know, pride. And there was the, the rainbow on it and everything like that. And, and so I would talk to them and... I said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to read Romans 1 and then come back and tell me what you think of it. And I had to keep reminding and I kept asking, hey, did you read it? What would you think? And well, not only that, but then there's the teachings uh, here at the church and their opinions started to change. The, the word of God tore their heart and for, for the good. Because sometimes the word of God will tear the heart and the, the person will turn the other way and say, I, I don't want it. Get that away from me. And that's what happened. They brought the Bible and showed their friends. And their friends took the Bible, tore the pages out of the Bible said, I don't want anything to do with this. And you might think that's not a big deal, but to me, that word is so precious to me 
That word to me is like the United States flag is to a soldier who fought for the country, who saw friends die for the country or for that flag. So when that flag is burned and stepped on and spit on, what, th what that soldier feels is what I feel when somebody disrespects the Word of God. I know it's just a book, but it's not any book. So to me, that is a big deal. And so this person was ridiculed and mocked because of that word. But that word will, it's a, it's a sharp double-edged sword. It, it'll divide soul and spirit. It'll divide friends, too, and family. But that book will change your life forever. Amen. Purpose it in your heart. I've quoted this before, Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So now we're going to jump back into Daniel. I'm going to review really quickly. When we saw the siege of Daniel and his friends, and others like them, we learned that Nebuchadnezzar wanted the cream of the crop. They were of royal descent, the best looking, very intelligent, already versed in science and well educated. They were prime to be taught the language and the sciences of the Chaldeans, which included astronomy, astrology, magic, incantations and interpretations of dreams and omens. Now, if you remember, the Chaldeans were a separate people, but they were assimilated into uh, Babylon. And I want you to see this, uh, this clay tablet that was found. It's called the Plimpton 332 tablet. And when you look at this tablet, it looks like just a bunch of nonsense, but what, what the, the, they did is they took a stylus with different edges and they would take the clay tablet and just like we would work math out on paper, they would work out their math on this clay tablet. And all these different uh, notches were different numbers. And this was found 1,200 years, it's dated 1,200 years before the Babylonians took Daniel and his friends. And the amazing thing about this is this is a set of Pythagorean triples. And that's where, that's where I got lost. Like... <laughs> I could, you could read the numbers, and you could learn the numbers real quickly, what, what each little notch means. But when they started talking about that, I was lost. And that was 1,200 years before. So imagine what 1,200 years of learning math did for the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. I mean, needless to say, they were smart people. And this wasn't base 10 like, we have base 10. We have a decimal system. This was base 60, which is sexagesimal. Again, they were smart people. I, I ran a across a math video. It was like a two-minute video I was going to show, but it's like only I would find it interesting and all the math nerds <laughs> in here would find it interesting. But... They needed some smart people to teach this to. So let's get back into Daniel. Daniel 1. And so we left off at verse 5, and it says, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among them 
From among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. The names, this is what the names mean. Daniel was God is my judge. Changed to Belteshazzar, which is Bel will protect or Baal will protect. That's a Babylonian God. Then you have Hananiah is the gift of the Lord. Changed to Shadrach, which is inspired of Aku, the Babylonian moon god or the kind of the, the number one Babylonian god. Mishael was who is like God, changed to Meshach, which is belonging to Aku. And Azariah was helped by God, changed to Abednego, or servant of Nego or Nebo, the Babylonian god of wisdom. So Nebuchadnezzar took these Jewish boys with their God-honoring names, changed their names, tried to brainwash them for three years, even gave them the food that the king ate from and the wine, and all this with the hope that these boys would be assimilated into Babylonian culture. But what Nebuchadnezzar was going to find out was that all of his tried and true tactics that worked on everyone wasn't going to work on these guys. Because they weren't everyone. Take away from this. Don't be everyone. Be set apart and dedicated to God. Then we get to verse 8. And this is as far as we're going to get. This is awesome. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is an awesome, awesome truth. And just so you know, next time we get together, I'm going to get much farther, okay? We're going to get into chapter 2. It's going to be great. But he purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart. Purpose boundaries in your life. Purpose boundaries in your life. He directed his mind towards setting up boundaries that said, I will not go past this line lest I fall into sin. I will not do this because of my deep respect, reverence, fear of God. He set up even the most basic Thing, the fundamental of life is eating and drinking. It reminded me of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether I eat, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. And really that whole teaching that Paul does there is a parallel to this. And it's, it's awesome because Paul says, I could do all these things. I could eat all this food, but it's not expedient. It, it doesn't help others. It doesn't encourage others. As a matter of fact, it might even make others stumble. In Daniel, he's in Babylon filled with pagan gods everywhere, just like uh, Corinth was filled with pagan gods everywhere. And there's, there's three things. Daniel purposed in his heart. Why? There's three things that commentaries say. They say that maybe the meat wasn't prepared correctly. And there was still blood 
in the meat because the Jews were not supposed to eat consumed blood. Another possibility is that the food was taken and sacrificed to idols. And then if Daniel would partake with that food and that drink, he would be worshiping the idols. Or another one is that maybe there was a kind of a table side uh, sacrifice, if you will. They would come to the table side, do a drink offering and a meat offering, and then give it to you. And then you would again be partaking of the worship of those idols. But the common thread here is that it would defile Daniel. And none of it would bring glory to God. And that's what Daniel wanted to do. Why is this important to us today? I, I read in 2 Peter 3 that what manner of persons ought we to be. I'm going to step on toes right now. I'm going to offend some people right now. I want to talk to the sipping saints. Am I judging? No, I'm not judging. I struggled with alcohol for a long, long time. I don't, I don't feel I am recovering. I feel I have recovered from alcohol. But listen, I remember seeing on Facebook, Facebook, Facebook tells all, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I remember seeing there uh, people, a group of people together, Christian people at a sporting event getting a little crazy, doing things that they probably shouldn't do. All of them had their, their alcohol with them. But how do they know in that group that there isn't that one Christian that is kind of struggling, looking up to that other Christian, saying, wow, I didn't know that this was fine. This was accepted among Christians. That we could just do this. We could go to the sporting event. We could drink all we want. We could, we could act a fool. Because it lowers our inhibitions, doesn't it? Now, again, I'm not judging. I'm the, I'm the chief sinner among everyone here. But what I am looking at is, are we causing others to stumble? That's what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 10. Are you causing someone to stumble? Can you do it? You can do it. But don't cause yourself to stumble for sure. But don't cause others to stumble. That's, that's a huge thing. I think when, when Jesus was talking about the children and causing the, the child to stumble, it wasn't just the children. It was the, the children in the faith. Those that are, are just beginning to follow Jesus. So I think we need to, to think of those things. I think that it's if, if we make clear, conscious, questionable choices, especially in front of others, we know what those are, right? We know what those questionable choices are. And so we should stay away from that. We should... Purpose boundaries in our life. Strong boundaries. Does that make sense? Yes. Is everyone going to come back next week, I hope? <laughs> the last thing is that we need to purpose boundaries in our child's life. Daniel must have already had this boundary in his life. I've got to believe that this young man didn't come to purpose this in his life when he was being carried away. Or when this wonderful spread of food and wine was put before him. I, I have to think, this is me speculating now, that 
And I researched this, and as I did, I saw other people were thinking the same thing. So I was like, okay, I must not be like way out there. But if Daniel was brought up by Jewish parents, then he would have known Deuteronomy 6, 5. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, Wait, heart, I'm on page 10 of my notes. Does anybody remember? Lay Bob. The same heart. You love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your inner man, your mind, your will, your affections. You love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. This would have been taught to him. Listen to this. This was literally rolled up into a scroll and put, when the, when the Jews would go into prayer, was put in a box. It's called a frontlet. And it would be, I, I asked Vanessa if I could buy a frontlet <laughs> to wear it for this message. She thought, eh, maybe not. And, and the more I thought about it, I was, eh, maybe not. So, but then... But then they also had a box on their hand. I find it very interesting, Pastor, that it was on their forehead and on their hand, and that's where the mark of the beast is going to go. I I wonder if it's kind of a, yeah, it's just kind of crazy to think that way. But and then go to uh, Deuteronomy 6, look at this. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Same, same heart there. You shall teach them to your, diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So, if I'm right, Daniel was raised with these clear boundaries. And parents currently raising kids, this, this spoke to me, and I, listen, I fail in this all the time. My, my kids say that I, I speak scripture to them too much. That's why I'm thankful for Oma and Papa because they receive from Oma and Papa. But listen, no, it's, it's up to us to do this. Dads, whose job do you think this is? It's father's job. That's why Satan skirted around E, or Adam and went to Eve because Adam's the spiritual covering over the wife. Ephesians 5, we were supposed to sanctify by the washing of water, with the washing of water, by the word of God. We're supposed to sanctify our wives that way. But then Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your kids to anger. Why does it say that? Dad, dads, do we like to poke a little bit? Yes. I, I, I don't get it. I do it all the time. It's in the word for a reason. Do not provoke your kids to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's our job. We're supposed to be teaching the Word of God. Satan knows that if we follow Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, that he's got no chance in destroying the family. He's after the families. He's tearing families apart. 
He's, he's making dads not available. If the dad's not available, then it's the mom's job. Right? Listen, single moms, I commend you for everything that you do. And this is on your shoulders as well. To teach the word of God to your children. And listen, if, if you're married and dad isn't, isn't having this, it's your job, mom, to do this. How awesome if we can raise our kids in the word of God and they would become like Daniel. And they would purpose in their hearts that even the fundamentals of life, eating and drinking, would glorify God. So we want to purpose the Bible in our life. We want to purpose boundaries in our life. And we want to purpose boundaries in our child's life. 